Today's Snail Mace Warrior partner is Become Stronger. We want to take the time to thank them for the offer that will be provided during this episode and for teaming up with the podcast to provide a better listening experience for you. You can find out more about Become Stronger at become-stronger.com. All right, guys, Snail Mace Warrior here. And today we have someone special. We have Coach Rich Thurman the Third. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, you can just go on RT3. <laughs> <laughs> or RT3. Uh, so Coach R3, uh, RT3, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. He has over 15 years of experience as a coach and personal trainer. He has a bachelor's from UCLA in physiological science, a master's from USF in sports management, and he started as a physical therapy aide to athletic trainers, uh, and he was an athletic trainer assistant for the National Champion City College of San Francisco Rams football team. And it goes on and on. I mean, you have tons of certifications, so I know this is going to be like an awesome episode for the listeners. Um, and just um, to note as well, he has the Upgrade Guys, right? Upgrade, the upgrade Guys, guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, yeah. what's the other dude's name? Nat. Nah. All right. Nah, yeah, yeah. Non. yeah. Yeah. I like him. He has good vibes too. Um, yeah. so he's super knowledgeable. Um, so yeah, you can check that out on Instagram, Facebook. I'll add it on the blog post below. And then he also coach, uh, Thurman has a podcast available on YouTube and I'm assuming your website. Are you on any apps? Uh, I'm not on any apps right now. I just, okay. I actually just put that on my YouTube for now, but yeah. um, you know, as soon as I strip the audio, I'll, I'll be putting it up somewhere else as well. So right on all right so check them out there guys all right so let's get to know you um tell us a little bit about you how you started in fitness and it kind of like what led you to the mace all right um so i think like when i was i mean i was i was always an athlete you know growing up um did track and field um in middle school soccer um what else you know tried my hand at baseball because my dad was in the softball and baseball and stuff like that. So right on. I was always interested in, in different sports. Um, I kind of settled with football when I got to high school. Um, I really liked, um, you know, I may not seem like uh, the, the aggressive type, but I, I have, you know, two sides of myself and um, I, I'm pretty low key. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty low key in general, but you know, if you put some pads and a helmet on and um, you know, I'm like the honey badger, you know, like I, I was really, um, I played strong safety. So I like to hit. Um, and even though I played running back, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time eluding people. I, I often would like try to find somebody to hit. So that, that <laughs> kind of, <laughs> that kind of didn't uh, work so well for me sometimes. So I worked well as a good lead blocker sometimes cause you know, I was interested in running people over. So, um, and I'm kind of small, so I'm not the biggest of guys. But um, so I've always had like a, you know, sort of underdog mentality. Um, you know, I, I was um, kind of, a, a, I want to say an average student, you know, but I, I mean, I went to a really good high school and um, it, it kind of, that kind of shaped me into who I am today because, um, you know, it's like you go to one school and then you excel and then you go to another school and then like competitively you know, and the grade on the curve and all this sort of stuff. And you kind of feel like, well, I'm kind of falling in the middle, but you're falling in the middle of like very high level students, you know? So, you know, leaving high school, I kind of, I was kind of, um, you know, discouraged to a certain, you know, degree. Um, went to junior college, um, tried my hand at, at football there, um, before, before ending up, you know, quitting the team after, you know, talking it over with the offensive line coach who was like, you know, you're a really smart guy. And I think, you know, if you got goals to, to go, you know, on the college, you know, university pass here, he was like, you know, you, you probably fare better if you just focused on, on your education. And so, um, you know, I, it was a tough decision, but at the end of the day, I think it was the right decision because, you know, I, I intended to go, you know, on to a UC and um i really wanted to go to ucla and um so i applied to ucla it was the only university i applied to got accepted um went um i knew i wanted to study science i initially you know was thinking i wanted to be a 
like a, a surgeon, um, you know, a orthopedic surgeon. Um, and um, while I was in school, I kind of just saw how much more school was required <laughs> right. to, to be yeah. a surgeon. I was like, man, I don't, I don't feel right. Like just giving all my time, you know, like this and money um, like that. And um, so, you know, I kind of started, you know, putting a pause on, on that idea and decided, you know, after school, I'm just going to explore, you know, some other ideas. And, and uh, when I got back home to San Francisco, um, you know, I got a job at, at the Olympic club here. And um, so it gave me an opportunity to just kind of make some money and, and, uh, you know, see what, you know, kind of interact with people who, you know, had money and could afford training and things like that. And so um, gave me insight into that uh, world. And at the same time, I was, I was looking for more. And so I, I um, met the athletic trainer at um, San Francisco City College um, by referral and um, went in there, was interested in, in seeing, you know, if I might want to be an athletic trainer, because I, you know, I still wanted to be around sports. I still like the camaraderie of being around the guys and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that experience was, was really cool because, you know, it kind of, it was a rite of passage, you know, because I, I was like, I showed up and, uh, guy was like, okay, so you're here, go get some ice, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm gonna show you, he's like, basically, I'm gonna show you how to do this. You go get the ice, fill it up, bring it here. And I sat there the whole day and he pretty much didn't do anything with me. And I was like, all right. Sort of like a water boy. Yeah. So I, there with so, the water. yeah. So in a way I was like, it was like day one, I was just kind of like water boy. And mm -hmm. I remember coming home and being like, you know, should I go back? Should I not? Next day I showed up. I just went to get the ice, came back and, um, you know, he was like, okay, you know, I showed some initiative. So he was like, you know, I'm going to teach you something today. And um, so he started teaching me, you know, a little bit about what he's doing. You know, I still didn't have any hands on, but he was still like, you know, let me show you what I'm taping ankles and, and taping the guys and the process of what I do on a daily basis. And so I was like, okay, cool. And so I ended up doing that and, and gradually working my way up to becoming like an assistant to him. And, and even though it was non-paid, you know, you know, I eventually was taping ankles, got a chance to do things like the East West Shrine game. So I met, you know, guys from all around the country who were, you know, became pro, um, you know, and the city college team was really good. It was a national championship team. So a lot of those guys, you know, went on to Alabama and places like that and became pros. And so um, it was just an interesting time, you know, to be a part of, uh, of that realm. But I was still in that kind of space of like, you know, I don't know if I want to be a strength coach specifically athletic trainer um, or physical therapist. Cause while I was doing all this, I was a physical therapy aid as well. So I had like right. three jobs. Wow. You know? Hustlers Which, always been in you, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's, uh, it was, you know, I was, I was only 23, 24 years old. So, you know, it's while you've got the energy, you know, exactly. I, I, I still don't know how I, how I managed all that <laughs> still hanging out with my friends at night and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, you have a lot more energy at, at those ages. And so you might as well do it then, you know, might as well give your time away then. Right. Um, ended up going to graduate school. Um, and, uh, it was in graduate school where I met a guy that, uh, was working at a personal training only facility. Mm. And so, you know, he, he looked at what I was doing and, and he said, you know, if you're interested in personal training, you know, you should come check this out. And so I checked it out and I was like, okay, this is interesting. Um, it's not 24 hour fitness or, or any of those big box sort of spaces. So I never worked in any of those, those sort of spaces. Um, and so I got a kind of an idea of how, you know, the operation worked. And um, in grad school, I started putting together, you know, a plan, business plan in order to like, you know, branch out on my own and do my own thing. And so by the time I was done with, with graduate school, I pretty much just, you know, ran my own business. And um, from there, just spent a couple of years kind of operating and growing that. And, you know, this is pre, 
it's funny it's gonna sound crazy because it's like 2004 you know 2005 and you know youtube and even this mode of communication we have right now was was not it available yeah you know what i mean like yeah it's to me it's weird to be on that on that like generation that kind of was a part of not having it mm -hmm. but then also a part of having it and so it's like we're in that transitional space, you know, where it's like, man, I remember when YouTube didn't even exist. And it was just like, <laughs> you didn't have all these options and opportunities yeah. to like, to really share, you know, what, you know, what you do. And so, you know, as a business owner, you know, trying to get a website up, you had to spend a couple thousand dollars for some person to, to do it and then basically hold you hostage. Mm -hmm. you know for any like additional work you needed on your website and stuff like that and so you know I was I was quite you know frustrated by that sort of thing and financially it was like I can't afford to to do the things I want to do with the web and stuff like that and so um I, I had a big transitional you know moment um around 2000 2005, 2006, um, I was about 28, 29. And, uh, you know, my, my uh, cousin was, was murdered here in San Francisco. Oh. And uh, mm -hmm. it kind of, it kind of put a lot of things in perspective, you know, for me, like, it, it made me think like, what have I been doing these years, what, you know, what could I be doing? What, what did I want to do? You know, like all those things kind of like started like flooding me, like, right. you know, and, and I realized that there was a lot of traveling I wanted to do that I hadn't done. And so, um, I remember a friend invited me to his wedding in the Philippines and, uh, I was one of the groomsmen. And after that two weeks, I came home and I told everybody like, I'm gone. Like, I don't, I'm not even, they were like, nah, you're just kidding, whatever, he's just kidding. I was like, I'm gone. Like, y'all don't even understand. And, and uh, within, I think it was like May, he got married in May, like May 10th, something like that. Some of the first week of May, I think it was. And by mid-June, I was living in Korea. That's so, crazy. And it's, so, I was going to ask you about all your traveling too. So I'm glad we <laughs> tapped into that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that I arrived there with, with no knowledge of Korean culture, no knowledge of Korean language, um, not knowing what to expect at all. Um, I just, I just did it, you know, and um, that year that I spent there, I was, I was teaching English and, uh, you know, I thought at that time, you know, that's why it's 2018 and I only have, that's why I say I have like 15 years of, of training experience because that, that year that I spent there, um, I thought I wouldn't go back to, to fitness. Um, I thought, you know, I'm going to just teach um and uh that's you know that's what i want to do and um uh, and travel and uh i intended to go back to to korea but you know circumstances didn't didn't allow for it and um but i you know i while i was there i had a, a kind of a love you know hate relationship but it ended up being more love than 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 hate it's just you know being in a different environment you know, right. not being able, you know, having like culture clash. Yeah. I'm assuming it's like kind that. of uncomfortable, right? Um, I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable for, for a variety of reasons. And I think like for me, it, it boiled down to understanding that like the people I worked with, like really loved me and really mm -hmm. took care of me. And so like, I never judged the people of Korea based on like individual incidents that that happen, you know, maybe because of the color of my skin or whatever the case is. Um, I knew for a fact that because of these people in my school and around me like cared so much that 
like it couldn't be all Koreans, you know what I mean? It couldn't be like this for everybody. And so for me, I kind of saw myself as like an ambassador of sorts, you know, my, like I was the first person, the first black person that anybody in my neighborhood is seeing like in person, like in real life. Wow. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so, so they were kind of like, I mean, I, literally I walk out of my apartment and people would just be like, <laughs> oh my goodness. And so, and the kids at the school, you know, they want to, you know, touch my arm and like, you know, what, you know, like literally they had zero exposure to half the times is to any foreigner, Wow. let alone a black foreigner. So they may have seen like somebody black on television, but that's about it, you know? So to them, it was like, wow, this is amazing, you know? And so yeah. I had to put that in perspective and, and realize that a lot of what they, what they projected or felt was based on their inexperience or their uh, their inability to access, you know, someone right. like myself. So, right. Um, so that that in of itself was like overwhelming, you know, yeah. for in a lot of uh, ways. But after the first after the the year, like I was able to speak, um, you know, elementary level Korean. You know, I was able to read, you know, most of the. Um, signs like if i couldn't if i couldn't understand what i was reading i could still like you know uh pronounce it and and kind of enunciate it and see what it you know say it aloud or whatever the case was so right. um for me it was just learning vocabulary at that point in time like asking people like what does that mean you know so i could read it but it's like what does that mean you know so yeah. um so i ended up you know not going back um, I've only been back as a visitor at this point, but, um, I ended up moving to Thailand. Um, and I spent like a year and a half, I think it was to two years, um, teaching science in Thailand, mm -hmm. um, in English to, um, in a private school. And, um, after that, uh, after that, towards the end of that second year, things got, you know, really, you know, rough because, um, you know, unlike here, we don't have like labor protections, you know? Um, um, and so, you know, there were some things that I was like, I'm not satisfied with. And I, I voiced those things and I had become, you know, I had been put in a role of leadership, you know, like pretty quickly. I'd moved up and, and become like a head teacher for my school and stuff like that. And I was working for an outside organization. Um, but like a lot of the people working with me were not happy about like certain things. And so I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm the leader. I got to voice this. And so I stood up and they were like, you're fired. Oh my God. So like, <laughs> Like, we're going to cut this off at the head completely. Let all these other guys know, like, if you don't like it, like, you can either keep your job or you wow. can go the same way he went. Like, they were like, we won't hesitate to, like, you know, let people go. So um, I was in Thailand with no job. Wow. And, 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 like, they didn't care. And um, But fortunately um, for me, during that two years, um, I had built – a strong community outside of outside of um, that environment, and um, I learned I had learned to dance salsa while I was in Thailand, and so I was really tightly associated with the salsa community, and um, you know that community was everyone from Thai people to a lot of expats. So there were people from you know Germany, Sweden, France you know, you name it and people with wow. all types of different jobs, you know, and different, um, you know, different expat jobs, you know, so, um, those connections proved to be like useful when I came, I was like, yo, I don't have a job. And so a few people were like, yo, so what did you do in the States? You know? And I was like, well, I was in fitness. And they're like, you should talk to this dude. Mm. And, um, I ended up going for an interview at a guy's uh, gym there. And um, it's, it's now um, the CrossFit Bangkok or something like that. 
but um, it was this company called Fit Corp uh, Asia. And, um, you know, I won't go into details on, on, on that whole <laughs> experience, <Yeah. laughs> but, you know, I, I immediately was, was kind of once again promoted to like fitness development manager. So I was, you know, in charge of, you know, creating uh, continued education development for, you know, training staff and, and creating new programs and helping develop some of the programs we have at the U.S. Embassy and, Oh wow! Um, and uh, just a lot of different things. We were we were doing um, uh, education for uh, physical education at international schools. Um, you know, we traveled to Hong Kong. We did beach boot camps. Like there were all types of things that we were like um, doing. And um, I ended up branching out and leaving that um, for my own personal reasons. Um, and starting my own business in Thailand. There you which, go. <laughs> always going back to, to building your own business, huh? Because of all yep. the shit, right? It's, a, it's always the case. It's always yeah. the case. Like, I think, you know, I commend people who are, who are able to either withstand the BS that comes with working for, um, some of these, some of the people out there who, who like, I think there's a certain amount of humanity you have to have as a person, like, like we're people first, you know? And so, you know, that kind of bothers me about a lot of the ways people approach their, their, their businesses is it's like, it's such a capitalist thing mm -hmm. to like, not really care about the people who work for you or with you you know and so um starting my own thing it was like well i can do what i want and you know get paid how i would like and you know that i can serve the people i work with better because right. i'm not stressed about i'm not stressed out about what this guy above me thinks i should be doing with my clients, right? I can be more authentic with my clients. And the only person I have to, uh, you know, I have to adhere to is myself, right? If I lose the client because mm -hmm. this is my belief system um, and this is the way I operate, then that I have no one to blame but myself, you know? And so, but, you know, as you get older, you kind of realize, you know, the, the client, you're there to serve the client, but at the same time, you should have an ideal client and you should have an ideal person that you want to work with. And they, in the interview process of, of getting that client, you know, it should be clear, like, this is the way I operate. This is the way my programs are designed. This is how I approach fitness and health. Um, and if you want that path, then join me. If you don't, then go find someone that will give you what it is you're looking for. Right. And so if you're confident in that, I think you, you end up being successful. And you might not, you know, get everyone. I mean, but you get the people who make you happy. You right. Know? And, that's, and that's, that's what we want to be, right? Right. So, yeah, yeah that was Bangkok. Um, it allowed me to stay for a couple of years, um, longer. I think I ended up staying for three more years, um, cause I stayed for five and a half years total. And, um, in that time period, I met my wife who's from, uh, Singapore, um, at a fitness conference. And, um, we spent about, I think a year, um, before deciding to get married. Um, and, uh, once we got married, you know, it was like, we either, we either have to live in Singapore or we have to move back to the U S and, um, she was like, let's go to the U S and I was like, cool, let's go to the U S because there's <laughs> <laughs> Singapore is an Island. And, um, you know, I, I just feel very limited by, um, island space, right. which is kind of, you know, <laughs> small. <laughs> small, um, yeah. So, you know, and getting back to the U.S., you know, I, I, you know, I felt like 
I can do what I do anywhere. Like I, like I've done it in a foreign country, you know, right. just like any immigrant who's come to here, come, come here, not knowing the language and, you know, was trying to make something, you know, out of, out of nothing. Um, you know, that, that experience going abroad, was like, I can, if I can do it there, I can do it in my home country, no problem, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So basically came back, started a, started a, you know, boot camp initially, um, just to kind of get exposed to more people. And, you know, all my friends that, you know, have been like, damn, he's been gone almost a decade. <laughs> I was like, I was like, yo, you guys were all talking on, on Facebook about, you know, how you wish I was doing that here. You wish I was, you know, back here so you could train with me. It's time to, it's time to show up, you know, so. <laughs> so you got them all. Uh, <laughs> You're like, come out. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people came out. If they didn't come out, they sent people, you know, which was, which was also cool. And so, um, you know, over time, some of those people turned into personal training clients, you know, or referrals or, you know, word of mouth kind of got around. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it, it just grew from there. And, um, and at, th at this point you were, what type of training were you doing? Like what modalities specifically? So like I was camp? still, so, okay. So like my own training and personal training and stuff like that, I was still very much, um, into the aesthetics uh community to some degree you know so aesthetics and strength and conditioning strictly um from a traditional standpoint of strength and conditioning so you know let's get your barbell work in let's you know do um you know traditional stuff right. um wasn't very like movement driven um i had the animal flow cd um, or DVD um, at the time, but you know, I was doing very little out of that. And then on top of that, my body, you know, was built in such a way at that time that it it couldn't like accommodate those things that that animal flow had to offer. You know, right. so basically, I didn't have the prerequisite ability to do it. I was strong, you know. At the time, I was, you know. 225 for 12, you know, to 15 reps um, on the bench or, you know, squatting over 300, you know, pounds and deadlifting almost 400 pounds. But, you know, I was probably about 25 to 30 pounds heavier than I am right now. And, um, you know, my mobility was, was shot. It wasn't there. It was just non-existent. And, um, I think I was about 30, let's see what I'm in now. I'm 41 now. So I was 37 at the time. Was that, the, was that the before and after you showed? Cause you posted one on Facebook not too long ago. And I was like, so like impressed by the differences. The, the squat or the, or there was before one, and after picture. I think it was like a posture one. And I was like, wow, that's crazy how much your body changed. The posture was a fairly short uh, period of time, and that that one wasn't so much to do with um, a difference in my in my uh, physique, mm -hmm. as much as it was just uh, you know. So there was a there was a period of time where I spent a lot of time changing uh, my my you know physique, like how how my body is you know structured, like. Mm -hmm. letting go of the bulk, you know? Yeah. Um, so there was a time period where I just had to just, just cut and cut and cut. Um, and so, you know, I, I believe you can focus on two things at once, but you know, my, my number one priority was getting, you know, my weight down to where I want it to be and where I feel like it, you know, my body should be comfortable, would be comfortable. Right. Um, and then, you know, the next part was then, you know, working on, you know, the things that I, that I enjoy. And for me, like animal flow was something I wanted to enjoy doing and, um, you know, moving in general was something I wanted to enjoy doing. And especially as I, as I got older, I was kind of like, you know, 
it's it's hard it becomes harder like you know anybody who says it doesn't is lying like just flat out the body just doesn't do and and isn't isn't going to be capable of what it was when you were in your 20s your resiliency isn't there no matter how much quote unquote durability training you do or you know all this sort of stuff like now i spend much more time on that stuff than i do on the actual like lifting you know because you know at the end of the day for me what's most important is being able to move like right the amount of load i lift the amount of swings i do the amount of that shit means nothing to me like you like i don't care how many dudes are posting about they swing a 45 pound mace who cares like who cares really are you getting paid to do that <laughs> right you know like so in in my in my eyes the risk reward is not is not there like i'm if you told me you were going to pay me the money that lebron james makes and that i have to go out and play 82 games and then i have to go and do you know post season and then in the off season I got to still, you know, work my ass off and do all that sort of stuff. Well, you pay me millions of dollars. Like, that's great. Mm -hmm. But I don't get paid to do this. And so I'm not going to put my shoulder in jeopardy of, of being blown out and having to do half surgery. I'm, I'm just not. And so I'm going to be very, um, I, I explore, don't get me wrong. I explore movement. I explore things. I, you know, I try new things. I push, you know, some limits but all within um all within a space where i feel like i can come out tomorrow and still do what i want to do and i can come out next week and still do what i want to do um right. and you know this I'm talking to somebody who's i've never broken a bone never torn a ligament never had a cavity like you know and it's not that i haven't done stuff that that would put me in at risk of that but you know i want to keep it that way you know, right. <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah it sucks living with <laughs> injuries like i have a i have a chronic condition called costochondritis and it sucks mm -hmm. you know yeah. i felt i feel like the mace has been helping a lot but i would not load my body with a 45 45 pound mace or something because i know <laughs> that's gonna like whack me out right it's called defense <laughs> i mean and, and if you can do it great like you know, but you like, there's so many people out there who are, who I think are just not being, uh, honest to some, to a certain degree, you know, either with themselves and with others, you know, because, you know, I've gotten messages from people like, Oh, my elbow, you know, bothers me when I do, you know, swing the mace, mm -hmm. you know, but I want to keep swinging it or, Oh, my shoulder hurts when I do that. Or, you know, and I'm just like, well, like if you keep doing something and expect a different result, <laughs> I mean, we already know what the definition of insanity is, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think for me, I always tell people straight up, like, yo, my shoulder was wrecked after years of bench pressing and it's not all the way back. Um, there's, I have limitations on my right shoulder because of that previous issue but i work on a regular basis to improve that and i swing the mace better today than i did a year ago two years ago mainly because i spent time fixing my body more so than anything else like people are like oh you need to do x amount of reps to be you know to be proficient or to to, to make your mace swings be this good or that good. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't. Um, I don't believe that. Yeah. I, and I'm proof of it. Like I don't need to swing high volume in order to improve my mace swing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you pay attention to structure. Like I, I've seen you like posture structure, just everything. You're just so spot on with everything. Obviously, you know, over the years you've gained that experience, but like, uh, what's, what is the best way, right? What's the best way? What, like in your opinion, for, cause, cause you're saying that, you know, I don't have to do this many reps and, or, you know, oh, lift this yeah. much, like what's the best way for someone? 
So, I mean, my, my approach is, so a lot of like what we do, for example, with the upgrade guys, um, like our approach is to make sure things work. Right. And so like, we're, we're deeply rooted in, in, in FRC, uh, you know, methodology and, but you know, it's not the only thing that we, that we do. And there's a lot of people who use FRC and a lot of people who do stuff with FRC, but you know, I also think that you have to know how it applies to what it is you want to do or what it is you're trying to achieve, you know, and you know, there's a lot of organizations out there who have, have close relationships with FRC, but still don't apply it, uh, in, in, in a way that, that I apply it. And so I kind of integrate it, you know, in my workshops and whatnot, I kind of integrate some of the concepts and ideas into it, not just even from preparedness or having the prerequisites to swing, uh, the mace, but also in how you train with the mace, you know, and how you use it. Um, so for me, like, for example, um, if you look at, if you look at the body, um, for anything you do, there's certain prerequisite needs that your body has to have. Right. So if you want to, um, with the mace, if you want to swing the mace, there's certain joints that are involved, right. From, and you could argue, one could argue that it's from head to toe. Right. Right. But some joints are going to be more involved than others. Clearly the shoulder joint Mm -hmm. is one of the most involved joints in the swinging of the mace. Right. And so if your shoulders don't work right, then nothing's going to work right. 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 So it, it starts with making sure the shoulders work right. Right. Do you have the, the level of, um, internal and external rotation at the shoulder that is required? Do you have overhead range of motion? Do you have, you know, all of these different things? Do you have stability in certain positions of your shoulder? You know, like all of those things. And, you know, I've worked with some online, uh, uh, clients with this. Um, and a lot of times it's like, we're not, Oftentimes I'm like, put your mace down. Like I have to, I keep telling people like, put your mace down. And then on Instagram, I'll be like, man, there they go swinging the mace again. And it's (laughs) like, you, like, I, like, you're not going to listen to what I'm telling you. Then how is this going to work? Like, just give it time and trust the process. You know, it's, it's really great because the clients that I do have, um, that have come to me specifically for the mace, they trust the process. You know, they came in, we talked, I showed them where they're deficient, right? That's the one, what, the one thing that's hard to do at a distance or over the phone or over like a fa- face-to-face via video is like actually showing people where the issue is. Whereas in person, I'm like, look, your shoulder's supposed to do this but it can't <laughs> and they're like, and I'm like, if I, if I give you the mace and tell you to swing it right now, I'm just going to be doing you a disservice. And over the long run, it, you might find yourself hurt mm-hmm. and it'll be my fault. And I can't let that happen. So if you want to learn from me, you have to trust the process. If you, if you want to do it your way, then you can go find somebody else to work with you. Um, and so like, the people who, who work uh, with me, which only a few people have actually come to me here in San Francisco specifically for the maze because they found me through whatever means. Right. And um, they trust the process and they're, they're getting, they're quickly becoming, you know, decent swingers. Right. Um, but, you know, I think the thing is, is when you're, when your elbow hurts, you can't just keep <laughs> doing what you're doing and expecting that pain to go away, right. you know, like, and the sad, the, the sadder thing about that is that the body is going to protect itself. So it's going to change movement pattern to, to feel good. 
right? Like I, I don't want to feel that constant pain. So I need to change position to do it. And um, I mean, somebody just commented on one of my posts recently about having, uh, I think elbow pain, yeah, elbow pain. And they were like, yeah, but when I do this thing differently, then it seems to not, not feel the same. It, it feels better. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're not, <laughs> you're not addressing the issue right know. right and then so what is the i mean obviously you know i've talked to you before about my my case i think i facebook uh, messaged you or something but i mean do you see similarities when it comes to the elbow thing because i've seen i mean i talked to um to kelly manzoni yesterday and she also said that someone's having like a like an elbow problem or a wrist problem when they came to her like mm -hmm. is are like cases similar or are they very different from one another like if someone came to you and they're like i'm swinging but my elbow hurts um so for me like i do a full assessment you know regardless if you hurt or not like when i when i assess a person um i can pretty much already after the assessment i can pretty much tell you like if you do a on top of this you're going to end up having these complications down the line if you don't address this now and um but the elbow can be a lot of different things right because a lot of people point to their triceps tendon as mm. as you know where the the source of the elbow pain you know some people will, will point to the to the inside you know um which is or the or the outside right and so depending on you know what's going on um it could be a number of factors but i think you know what it usually comes down to is people you know something start you you may not notice like the small adjustments that you're making to compensate for something that you're lacking and so not noticing it due to like not having the awareness of of the body not noticing it you may be swinging and you're thinking like oh this is fine but your body is making those small minute adjustments every single time and it becomes a repetitive stress thing right and so you may just have this little issue at one part of your your, your elbow and you're making this little adjustment but now you have this inflammation rate you know radiating to another area Mm. right and so it it could be a num numerous things and so i always tell people like yo if if you have inflammation the first thing you got to do is allow the inflammation to disappear right or, or, or to go away you know and so that's that's one of the things that you know when i when i met uh hunter uh hunter cook uh who's one of the frc uh you know master coaches i guess it would be um, and just having a discussion with him about my shoulder, um, for the first time, it was like, he was like, if you're inflamed and you just keep doing stuff that's inflaming it, then it's, it's not going to yeah. get better. Um, and then I work, you know, fairly closely with some physical therapists here locally. And, um, one of which I'm actually moving my practice into uh, their facility. Um, when, I discuss with them different like movements and show them different movements and things like that. I can get feedback as to, you know, what they see and what, you know, potentially is going on. So we really take a, a real long look at how the body is moving and, and what the body is doing. And so I, for me, like I, I look through Instagram, you know, all the time and I can tell you right now who's going to have, you know, uh, back issues. I can tell you right now who's going to have elbow and shoulder issues. You know, I've, I've asked people straight up to their surprise, is there something that goes on with your right shoulder? Cause when you swing the mace this way, this happens. And you're like, what? I mean, and so all of it's been like a kind of a, uh, for me, you've seen the before and after, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've posted, I, I don't hide the fact that, I was a shitty May swinger, right? Wow. Like I think the problem I see right now is like everybody who's who's great at it is just like I'm great at it. And so and I think that goes for like most things in fitness, right? You see right. 
the the end result of people's path and everybody's like well damn i want to be like that person but you don't realize how long or how much work or you know what is the process of getting there and i granted some people pick up the tool and immediately can go and do it right like if you're a certain level of athlete you should be able to right you should have the coordination and skill to be able to to do it but for the average person for the 90 percent of people out there they don't have the baseline ability to swing the maze let alone do all the other stuff they're doing with with and you know what i think what the problem is too is that the most popular exercise with the maze is the swing and so everyone yeah. sees everyone else swing and they're like, I want to swing that shit too. You know, like I right. had a client last week and they're like, I want to swing. I'm like, well, I got to prep you and I got to teach you how to swing first. You can't just get into the, or, you know, like I started them off with like squats and lunges, you know, not loading them or stuff like that. Right. But I see them all the time, like just going straight into the swing and it's like, ah, oh, it sucks, you know? So it does. And that's, that's most people's entry point And it's, I mean, sometimes people have to learn the hard way. It's just the way it is, you know, like I, I used to swing the mace. Fortunately for me, like knowing that there's something not right and saying, I don't want this to continue, you know, kind of helped me uh, understand like what I need to do. And then I think falling into a community of people who I think like the FRC community who, who kind of gave me a, a kind of a, I guess a container to be in, to say like, to say all the things I was trying to, to, to think and, and, and articulate, like you need prerequisite, you know, ability. You need prerequisite foundational like capacity before you can build skill and you can only build as much skill as you have the capacity you know and so you know i've written a lot about this sort of thing and um just having the bandwidth to be able to run you know 4g lte you know through it right if you don't have the band if you don't have the 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 cables that are capable of carrying that then it doesn't matter how much you try to shove in there it's it's just not going to work right Right. so you know i always say like strip it back strip it down take the steps back before you go forward and so that's what's really been great about meeting people like hunter meeting people like uh nat um and even meeting you know people like uh uh paul gray you know because it kind of just reaffirmed like when when i met uh him and and pavel in in norway last year um when i went over to do the afm cert um you know it kind of solidified the fact like hey there are some people out there who approach this thing from a health first perspective and have no you know, care in the world about what you think about that, right? Like, uh, and, I, and I felt like empowered to a degree, like, you know, I'm, I'm right, you know, like, I don't care what, you know, somebody wants to say, like, we are health and fitness professionals. Yeah. And the, the, the word health is the first thing. And I think everybody has been like, oh, the fitness industry, the fitness industry, the mm-hmm. fitness industry. It's like, no, it's the health and fitness industry. So, you know, people got upset and tempers flared when I said you are not a warrior. Sorry. I did, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> not you in particular, but it was a, it was a, it was a post a post that I made um saying that, you know, you are not a warrior, but that that meant like it it was an overarching kind of theme of like the mentality that people have um out there within the fitness industry that some people have 
where it's like everything must be, you know, hardcore. Um, everything has to be go hard or go home. Everything right. has to be like this sort of push, 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 murder, murder, kill, kill sort of like attitude towards things. And so that's the approach a lot of people take to things like swing in the mace, which is a very complex thing. Um, and, you know, to me, it's like, it, it's the mentality, not, not trying to bash CrossFit, but the, the mentality that kind of grew out of uh, the CrossFit world. Oh yeah. Um, where you take a highly complex movement like a snatch and you do it for time and you do it after you've done something else, you know? And so it's, mm -hmm. it, it's strange, um, straight away from health. And, you know, that's a sport. It's, it, it's, let's call it what it is. Right. It's, it's sporting. Yeah. Um, and like I said, back to the beginning, if I'm LeBron James or if I'm, you know, getting paid for this stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's go. <laughs> let's, let's, you know, but you, you understand what you're sacrificing at that point, right? You understand that, you know, you're putting your body at risk, you know, and that when you get to 60, you know, you may be limping around like an old NFL player, you know, who, who beat their body up for a period of time, sacrificed for that dollar, right? It just goes back to the whole capitalism thing, right? Okay. But um, in, in my, from my perspective, I think health has to become a bigger point, a bigger emphasis in our approach to, to training. And, and I think when we do that, we have no problem scaling it back. And then when yeah. we approach our clients and the people we work with, from that perspective and we tell them like, Hey, I'm holding you here. Not because I don't like you. <laughs> I'm holding you. I'm holding you here because I know where you could go. If we, if we take these steps and I, and I don't want you to um, have the setbacks that I know can happen along this road. And, um, I think it develops trust. I think people begin to trust you. Like you, right. that person really cares about, they care about my shoulder more than I do. All right. <laughs> like they care about. <laughs> like I've been treating my shoulder like shit. He actually cares. <laughs> right. right. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, that's, that's important, you know, yeah. with, with people. Um, right yeah. on. All right, so let me ask you something because you have a video out on YouTube and it was about breathing, uh, mm -hmm. which I love because I haven't seen enough about breathing and mace. Like what's the proper way of breathing when you're like using the mace? And you can use whatever exercise as, a, as an example. Yeah. You know, I, I haven't delved enough into that, into that realm. I mean, I'm, I'm sure... And I don't feel like I'm qualified to even make that uh, statement. I think people like Paul Volkovinsky, who've spent a lot of time, you know, with the traditional origins of the tool, probably has a, a deeper understanding of of the means in which it was supposed to be done, you know. Yeah. And so, um, and then also, I would say, um, uh, what's his name, Marcus. Kihas, who wrote uh, was it Hanuman Power, um, right. would probably have more more, you know, on that um, than I do because they approach it from its origin source, you know, which I think is is very important that we don't lose sight of of that. Right. On. Um, but for me, I just feel that like breathing is a major part of moving in general, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. that's what yoga is supposed to be in general. Yoga is breathing. And so the breathing is the, is the main aspect of yoga, but I think people get more involved with um, the asanas and, and, and right. like, can I do this pose? And can I do that pose? Yeah, and the I flexibility look so cool. and everything, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but they forget, they forget the aspect of, of breathing is the important 
the most important aspect of it. And so right. I think the same can be said for any movement that you do. Like we f- often forget to breathe and we, especially when we're under duress and stress. Um, and so, you know, with the mace, for me, I can talk while I swing the mace, you know, mm. and that's mainly because I, I've swung and I breathe and I, and I feel comfortable doing it. I feel comfortable swinging it and I feel comfortable breathing while swinging it. Um, in, in other aspects of mace uh, movement stuff and the more modern stuff, um, I would say like flow, like in, in flow, like for me, I try to tie my breath to my movement. Um, and, um, one of the, one of the, well, there's multiple reasons for, for why I kind of tie it in together like that. And I think one is, is that, you know, with, for me, Steel Mace Flow f- fits into uh, my air sessions with uh, AFM. AFM, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think when people are like, oh, that's just Steel Mace Flow. That's, you know, why are you calling it air? And <laughs> like, if you've, yeah. if you've gone through AFM, then you kind of, you, you then understand like that it's not renaming Steel Mace Flow, but it's just kind of giving you a way to, um, organize what it is that you do and you right. know organize your you know we we use the term i don't know if people even still use periodize but you know it's like the old school term yeah now but it just gives you a way of of understanding you know um the intensity levels that that i want to create while i'm doing a flow right um and then but i also um like when I was working with, uh, I had a meetup with, with uh, Venus, um, uh, Animal Flow Venus, Venus to be fab. And we, were, we had a meetup and we did a little movement session together and we were sitting there and we were um, talking about movement. And she was like, you got to breathe at this part. And she was like, you know, the breath is like the, you know, you know, the thing in the symphony, the guy that's doing, I was like, the conductor. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The breath is the conductor. And, um, you know, the movement is the symphony. And I was uh-huh. like, that, yeah, I was like, that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I was like, you know, I'm going to use that from here on now because, you know, I think, in that moment that we were doing that, we were just doing ground-based movement stuff. Um, and I started thinking, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense for, you know, whatever it is you're doing, flow, um, even your strength and conditioning. Like the movement is simply the, the, what can be kind of, it's the output, you know, it's, it's what's coming out of, of, of all the work inside but right. the conductor is is setting the speed and setting the tone and setting the pace and if the conductor is going nice and slow then the breath is gonna be nice so if the breath is long then usually the movement is long mm-hmm. right if the breath is if the breath is sharp then usually the movement is sharp right so right if you if you scroll through your through your feed now and you go back and you watch like uh mike fitch do his animal flow and you watch some of his sharper animal flow movements you'll and you listen to him move you'll hear on some of his sharp like side kick throughs and things you'll hear like Mm -hmm. and so you start thinking about boxing you start thinking about martial arts you think about all these different things like when you punch you have to have a sharp breath right it's a quick it's a sharp movement um, but if you want something to be more length, if you want it to be lengthened, you have to like make that like compression. So if you want it to flow. You have to actually like breathe. Right. Out, right. So, you know, for me, that's, 
that just gives me different ways of, of controlling pace and controlling timing and controlling, and, you know, I'm not perfect at it. And, you know, it's, it's still a process, you know, it's just still something that, you know, I play around with and um, explore. Right on, man. That was a really cool little uh, conversation about breathing. I mean, I know you said you're not the guy to talk about it, but that was awesome. I liked it. <laughs> Conductor and symphony. Yeah. listeners um let's talk about that shirt you're wearing because it attracted me and you shared with me that your wife had said that i'm pretty sure it's gonna attract women and it did it attracted <laughs> so is that new or yeah this is this is the new one so the first i i was doing uh so this the hanuman is um is the first logo i i came up with i had um, someone designed it for me based on, you know, s the specs that I was looking for. And um, uh, for me, you know, not, not like I know, like certain people are like deal with the religious aspects of, of Hanuman, but I just like, I actually like, I mean, I have Ganesh on my tattooed on my arm, but, and so I like some of the symbolism that, you know, Ganesh, uh, offers, right? But I also like the symbolism of of Hanuman, um, and so I wanted to go with that as a as a main logo for because it's you know movement and you know strength you know with with the tool, right? Um, and you know if you talk to to uh, Paul Polkovinsky, he'll you know his his explanation is that is not a weapon. Um, and so, oh, but if you, if people, on then. <laughs> if you, um, I mean, there's a lot of detail to it. Like I've read some stuff on, you can read on the site as well. I've read some stuff about, uh, you know, it is more of a symbol. It has more symbolism than uh, symbolic meaning than, um, the use as like something to bludgeon someone or, right. or, or to beat someone, you know? Right on. Um, so, um, that was the initial shirt that I made and I'm selling that one um, because a lot of the people were like, every time I wore it at my workshops, they're like, yo, where can I get one of those shirts? And I was like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make it. And they were like, yo, if you make it, I'll, I'll buy one. And I was like, all right, cool. Um, so I've got those up on my, on my site. And then this was the second shirt that I came up with. Um, it had always been in my thought process. Um, and, it you can't see the bottom part um which says rotation oh, and okay. that's and that's for that's for a reason that i made that more subtle and and the resist more pronounced um i believe you can't separate who you are at your core from your brand um and i believe that um that that you're the reason why i'm not attached or deeply attached to other brands or, or anybody else's brand um, is because, you know, I have to do what I believe is best and right for, for myself. And for me, the, the concept of resist in general can mean a lot for a lot of different people. And for me as a person of color and, um, as a person who is an ancestor of those who resisted and who resisted oppressive forces, um, who resisted, you know, uh, all the things that, that, um, you know, sought to keep, you know, people like myself from succeeding mm. and from, from being successful. Um, I thought it was important to like, make that bold statement like resist and then it just kind of the timing was also you know made sense too because like i'm a firm believer that you can't be uh you can't be uh like for equality for this group but not for that group and you can't be you know limited in that and so for me it's like this shirt resist rotation the resist rotation has to do with swinging the mace right like you just it's all types of 
fun play with, yeah. you know, anti-rotation, counter-rotation, all those forces. And even when you swing the mace or things like that. But at the same time, the, the deeper meaning of, you know, let's resist these oppressive forces, whether you're a female that is, you know, resisting the, you know, oppressiveness of, um, you know, people trying to determine what to do with your body, whether you're LGBTQ, um, who is resisting, you know, the issues that, you know, people want to, you know, deny you, you know, the equal treatment um, under the law, or whether you're a person of color or an immigrant or whatever. Right. Um, so for me, that, you know, that's what I wanted to express in that. I wanted it to have multiple meanings. Um, and I wanted it to have, um, I wanted it to stand out within the MACE community because I think that, um, I think that, you know, I don't know everyone in the MACE community, but I definitely am probably the most outspoken one regarding to social justice issues, mm -hmm. um, that, that swings the MACE. Um, and I would say that I'm likely the, I mean, I'm the only, there's a few uh, other, you know, African-American people swinging the maze, but mm -hmm. like, I'm probably the most, I guess, well-known black person <laughs> swinging right. the maze right. Right. right now. Um, and, you know, I don't want people to, I don't want people to, to believe that, uh, that these things don't affect me. Like that, that what's going on in this country and this world don't affect me. Like, you know, I, I said something on a, on a post the other day to someone that I think that it's important that if you respect me on a fitness level, health and fitness level, or as a coach or whatever, that you should also respect me as a person of color trying to um, survive in this uh, country and this climate on the streets. Um, you know, just understand that, you know, that violence towards um, any person of color, any black person by a police officer or whatever, it could be me. Right. Right. And so don't discount that. Don't discredit that. And, and, and then remember that because if it is me and if it does happen, that it's me, be aware of the things that people are going to say, well, maybe he shouldn't have done this, or maybe he shouldn't have reached in his pocket so fast, or maybe he shouldn't have done this or that. And so, you know, don't allow them to make excuses for about, for, for what I should or shouldn't have done. I'm a human being that has a wife and a child and is just trying to live my life in this country. Um, and so I think it's important that people, people recognize that. And, and I think that if we have, if we can have empathy about that and if we can as fitness professionals not separate, you know, who we are from what we do, um, then I think we'll be better for it and overall. Right on. I'm so glad you touched on that too, because I always see you so active talking about stuff like that. And it's good to just put it out there. And I love your shirt and I love the double meaning. That's awesome. So now I'm going to have to get me one. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, cool. So where can people find you online? And uh, do you have any resources or do you recommend any resources for Silme specifically? So um, you can find me on Instagram at coach underscore RT3 or uh, Steel Mace Workshops. Those are my two main uh, okay. pages. Um, Maces and Movement is the brand uh, for the shirts. Right on. And um, yeah, you can also like steelmaceworkshops.com for all my upcoming uh, workshop information, which have going to be in Elmira, New York at... Right there. Deck strength in the background. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, that's August uh, 18th. 
um, right on. weekend of August 18th. We're doing a Maces and Movement workshop. So this is something different than what I normally do. This is just a five hour um, kind of exploration of Maces and Movement. Um, and then I'll be back here in Oakland uh, doing a workshop for the first time in a year in the Bay Area. I haven't done any workshops at, really? at home. Wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, all of my workshops have been outside of the Bay Area. So, wow. Um, I'll be back here in Oakland. That's uh, September 8th and 9th. And um, you can find that information at steelmaceworkshops.com. And then um, I'll be, I'm scheduled to go to Dublin, Ireland. Uh, November 10th and 11th. So if you're in wow. Europe or UK, um, Norway, any of those places, Poland, you're, you guys are all close. Um, come on over, um, being hosted by uh, Strive Dublin. And so that should be, that should be fun. That should be interesting. Um, yeah. And as far as resources go, uh, I just a couple months or a month and a half ago, um, finally released my intro to steel mace, uh, ebook, which, um, is not what people expect all the time, but it's, it gives you more insight into my thought process and philosophy. So I if you're expecting, <laughs> if you're, yeah, you can get that ebook. What the you hell? didn't know about that. Now <laughs> I don't I'm know gonna why. Have to look at that. I have to look that up too. It's, it's out oh, there. Shit. Um, you can get that like right on my website as well, steelmaceworkshops.com. Um, um, you can click the link there and it'll take you to the, um, to the sign up to get that free download. And um, yeah, so it's not, it's not, you're not going to get a bunch of exercises and, and, and things like that. It's literally helping you understand like my thought process and perspective and give you more insight. And so if you're interested in, you know, my style of training and the process um, and learning and understanding the process, then, you know, get on that list because I think it, it, you know, I provide a long-term uh, solution and it's from a strength and conditioning perspective. So, um, you know, I think it'll, it'll be useful for most people um, reading. And then once you're on the list, you get, you know, all the stuff that, that I send out, um, which doesn't always go, uh, onto social media or, or onto websites. And some of my stuff comes out, some of the stuff I send out early there may show up on a, a blog post a couple months later, but you know, uh, you, right. you have it direct to your inbox. Right. Um, and then YouTube, I have YouTube. a lot of videos on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I love your YouTube. I, I'm, I'm always watching your YouTube. So if you have <laughs> views, I'm one of them. <laughs> all right well cool it was so awesome to talk to you i know listeners are gonna love this freaking podcast episode i think we've got a lot of knowledge from this i'm just so excited to release it and i'll make sure to add all the links below over to uh coach rt3 and um thank you thank you for saying yes and for being on the podcast i just what i just i want to say one more thing before i yeah. go to anybody who's who's watching and listening and stuff like that because I think it's yeah. it's important um, that as a coach that you believe in what you do you stand by what you do and that you never allow anyone to tell you that you cannot do it um, be who you are be authentic and build your brand build your brand and build who you are you don't always have to align yourself with, with people just to get ahead. You know, you can be your own boss, you can be your own person and you can do your own thing. And it, the struggle is there, it's definitely a struggle, but there's nothing in this world that's really worth it without a little bit of struggle. So, you know, I, I just say, keep going hard. I love it. Before we, before we leave, remember that guys. <laughs> remember all right well thank you um i appreciate you, you being on here i really do um again thank you for saying yes and may the <laughs> universe always flow with you thank you so much for having me appreciate it <laughs>